Kenneth Gladstone Turton of Mount Breverter St. Peter entered peacefully into rest at the age of 85. He worked in his early years at Worley Plantation and later followed his passion for mechanics while taking some time out for deep sea fishing. Member of Spitestown Methodist Men's Fellowship. Twelfth of 13 children. Husband of the late Euteline Turton. Father of Sherry Ann Turton. Stepfather of Garfield Stanford of London, England. Uncle of Janice Turton. Doriel Lewis Holder. And Marlene Rock, to name a few. Great uncle of Kim Lewis and Corey Greenwich. Uncle-in-law of Hugh Greenwich, Roderick, Rudy Edwards, and many more. Close friend of Selwyn Shun Bryan and Alex McLean. A memorial for the late Kenneth Gladstone Turton takes place on Tuesday, April 9, 2024, at Spitestown Methodist Church, Chapel Street, Spitestown, St. Peter, at 3.30 p.m. Live streaming of the memorial may be viewed via watch.earlsfuneralhome.com forward slash Kenneth Turton. In honor of Kenneth Turton, you're asked to make a donation to the Barbados Diabetes Foundation. Floral tributes may be sent to Earl's Funeral Home no later than 3 p.m., on Tuesday.
As we continue in worship, I invite us to sing together. The King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. seated as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we turn to you in the sorrow and grief of our bereavement, praying that we may find the strength we need in your sustaining grace, so that even as we mourn the death of one whom we knew and loved, that we may not be overcome by this trial, but we may hold fast, trusting in your goodness and mercy. Assure us, O Lord our God, that death is not the end of those who trust in you, and may our hearts be so composed in the Holy Spirit that all fear and bitterness may be swallowed up in the light and peace you give to your troubled children. Almighty and eternal God, who by the Holy Spirit minister to us in our weakness, by the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us the pledge of eternal life. Lift us, O God, we pray, above our present distress and sorrow, and shed the light of your grace and glory upon us. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we gather this afternoon in a solemn moment to commend 
the life of our brother Kenneth Thornton into the hands of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who sent his Son Jesus Christ to be our Redeemer, by whose stripes we are healed and in whose name alone we have salvation. So let us now take the opportunity to recall the life of our brother as we do it through a tribute that will be offered by the Spice Town Methodist Men's Fellowship and would then be followed by the eulogy. And before we have those, we will have the responsive psalm, Psalm 23. Psalm 23, and we'll say it responsively. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right path for his name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup run overflower. Amen. Amen. This afternoon, we remember our brother, Kenneth. Kenneth Thurton was affectionately known to most of us as Cheetah, a name which many of us knew him by even before learning his real name, because that was my experience. We knew him as a father, a brother, mechanic, fisherman. However, some of us knew him best as a friend one who could be depended on when in need. While he was among us here, we learned that Brother Kenneth boasted of his education here at the Spike Stone Boys School and how that schooling, as we put it, or as we would say, established and enabled him to go through life as he did. One of the activities we had at Men's Fellowship was called my favorite hymn. And when you chose your favorite hymn, you had to give the reasons why you chose that hymn. And this was one of Brother Kenneth's favorite hymns. And this is why we sang that hymn at the beginning, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is, because it took him back to his school days and he could identify his life with those words. Now, Cheetah could engage you in tales of dangerous experiences he encountered while he was working at Wardy Plantation and fishing at sea. But he would always end by saying he thanked God because he could have been dead, and God saved him. As a mechanic, he was excellent and could make any old engine work, and he enjoyed picking down and reassembling engines. In my personal experience, it is that he knew what was wrong with my car even before he could open my mouth to say, it doing this or it doing that. He would only look at me and say, man, I hear that last week. And I tell you, go and get some bushings and they would come and fix it. And I don't even know what bushings were. But I learned very fast because he was a good teacher. I know the days that the old B-21 could not roll out on a Monday morning to work unless Jesus bless it on the Sunday with his hands. He was just as good with the fishing boat and the fishing boat engines, and he loved fishing. Again, as we talked about God, and he said God was good to him, and 
the fellowship nights which we discussed many things about the Bible. I learned more about fishing than I never knew, including where the dolphins could be found and where the flying fish had gone. The danger was, as he said, the neighboring territories, their waters, if you stray too close, you could end up in the wrong waters and the Coast Guard will get you and you'll be in trouble. He could have written a book and call it Tales of the Sea. To many, he was a friend, but if you were his foe, you would know. After he got down in health and his hearing was going and his daughter took charge of him and he went to Grenada, we could depend to hear a fortnight, fortnightly phone call of what was happening and keeping up with everything and then popping up at some point seeing him come to visit. On his last visit, which I knew was his last because I asked him how he was feeling and he told me, well, I heard the Lord call me. So I said, you sure? He said, yes, everything is okay. So that was our last conversation. And next thing you knew, I got the phone call from his daughter that he had passed. But he had passed peacefully because he had made his peace with God. May God bless him as he is entered into rest. Amen.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming, supporting me today. Well, thank you, Rhino, for that beautiful tribute for my dad. Um, you spoke mostly about a lot of the things that everybody um, would know my dad for. So I'm going to, you know, speak from the heart and use my eulogy as <clears throat> a book of reference. So my dad, Kenneth Gladstone Turton, was an enigma to most. And like Reno so rightly said, he was a very, very funny man, you know? And a lot of you guys knew him for his fishing and the mechanics and everything like that. But today, um, it wouldn't be right for me to speak about my dad only without speaking about the wonderful woman that supported him throughout 53 years on this earth, which was my mom, Mrs. Udalyn Turton. She was one that supported him and kept him going and was there for him all the time. And daddy grew up as the 12th child of 13, you know, and his pet name or the name that most people in Spikestown or St. Peter would know him for is Cheetah. Um, some people said they don't know why and others told me that it was because he was really fast, but I don't know because he was pretty slow to me. So, hey. For all you guys that know where he got the name from, you could tell me later how he got that name. But that was the name that most people that knew my dad, um, they would call him Cheetah. Oh, you're Cheetah's daughter. And I truly am because you can see I'm the spitting image of him. And so rightly so, I am full bred Turton, not you know a part of the family, but one of those kids that, as you can see from this side, Doriel and Kim, we do look like the Turtons for sure. So daddy um, was, my grandmother's um, name was Mwadi. And for most of us that are people that grew up around me, I would remember that name a lot because as I was growing up, people would squeeze my cheek and I would slap them away and they were like, hey, Mwadi brown skin. And my dad would always say, don't worry about it, that's your grandmother. None of us saw her, we didn't grow up with her, but we knew of her. And my dad was always good to tell me little, you know, little anecdotes about him, to, about my mom, to, about my grandmom, to let me know that, you know, the impact, how I looked, how I reminded her of everybody, you know. Like Renel highlighted, he worked um, at the Warleaf Plantation for a long time. And a name that a lot of people probably wouldn't know, um, he always reminded me that he got most of his start from a gentleman called Mr. Packer. You know, that was a gentleman that helped him through, and then he followed his passion, which was mechanics. He could fix anything, as Randall highlighted. You, you hear it tinkering, he could fix it. Um, he moved from fixing buses, cars, um, as you, we would tell you, weed whackers, because we started a little side hustle there, you know, you want your weed whacker fix. He was waiting on anybody to do anything. He would do the only electrical because he did that once. And then my cousin Sherlin came and said, um, this ain't done right, you know. This ain't not going to pass inspection. But that was my dad. My father was one of those people that figured if it can be fixed, he would fix it. You know, and he was good at that. Sundays, he could be found um, hanging out, and not really hanging out, but working with Alec every Sunday. You know, that is where he would, and then he would head over to Bob. And men's fellowship on Thursday was his passion. He came down, hung out with the guys, and I don't think I should say where y'all went afterwards, should I? <laughs> I shouldn't say that. And, you know, but I could tell everybody what I used to call it, or my mom used to call it all the time. But the great thing of having um, a dad like mine, I knew I grew up knowing from both of my parents that I was truly loved. They showered everything that they could on me. Everyone that knows me and knows me well knew that also my parents were everything to me. Wherever I went, wherever I've traveled around the world, the two persons that I spoke about most of all were my parents, my mom and my dad. My father, um, you know, I was the apple of his eye. He worked and worked and toiled. He went fishing for days, deep sea fishing with my uncle, um, Kabbalah. Campbell Turton, sorry, his right full name, you know. Um, he went fishing with them or on one of his boats for, you know, days on end. And that is where he would be, you know, to help support me and run, take me through college. But my father loved fishing and mechanics equally. And as Rena highlighted, you can ask him anything about fishing or ask him anything about boats um, or about engines or anything like that. And when I wanted to get my first vehicle, 
and everyone was telling me, well, you know what, having um, you know, a car that doesn't have resale value, all my father said was, as long as I got an engine, don't worry, it can run, because I can fix it for you. Don't worry about that. It can always be on the road. And for 19 years, that car tinkered along, and it went along because daddy found a way to fix it. And if you can't find a part, he will find some wire, something to make it happen. And so that was how good he was. As my mom passed in 2018, and she went on, to, you know, my dad and I, being his only child, it was just me, and I decided, you know, a lot of the people would say to me, oh, you did so well, as so I would come back to Barbados or wherever I am, they would say, you're such a great daughter, you are such a wonderful child, you take your dad with you. And that might seem that way on the outside, but for me it was for selfish reasons, hey. He's my dad, I'm his only child, and it was a lot easier for me to have him with me. And we used to do our daddy-daughter um, you know, days, go to the spa, do all these little things together, and spend a lot of time, and I had the opportunity and the great privilege to spend the last four years with my father, which, um, with me moving around and traveling around, didn't get a lot of time. You know, you come in the house and you leave the house all the time. But my dad was always there. And one of the things he's good at, you know, he, when we would be coming home, and um, his hip, he always was limping and his hip hurting and he would be struggling. And for any of you that have traveled um, in the region, the regional flights, they stop off really far down. And my father refused to get a wheelchair. So at the front of the desk, when we go to the desk, the lady would say to me, are you getting him a wheelchair? And I would say, you should ask him. And she would say, are you getting a wheelchair? And you know, she can't hear too well. So he would say, what would you say? And she'd say, so you're going to get a wheelchair? And he would say, she'd tell you to ask me that, right? <laughs> but halfway through, I'll walk up. My father would be on the wall, leaning up, going, oh, shoot. I and I would be standing there, and people would be looking at me and saying, um, why don't you get him a chair? And I was like, why don't you get him one? And he would say, I good, I good, I good. And I just say, take your time. And no matter what, whatever made him comfortable, I did my best to make him comfortable. Because I know that my dad did every single thing that he could for me. So today, as we say goodbye to daddy, I would like to say that he was a devoted husband. When my mom got sick and we thought it was best for him to put her in a home, he was like, you crazy? This woman cooked for me, washed for me, she did everything for me. You want to put her in a home? If I break my back, I will do it. And he did pretty much, although we had home help, I like to say thanks to my not so little cousin any longer for coming in and stepping in when I was away. But all of my family stepped up and helped me and um, because daddy refused to let us put mommy in a home. And then, you know, I could say that I'm truly grateful to see what true love of a woman was because although she was miserable and let's not stand here and deny the fat boy, she called from morning till sundown, sun up to sundown. But no matter what, daddy came home. He always said, home is where you should be because you are the love of my life, you and your mom. And so with that, a devoted husband, he was a phenomenal dad. He worked toiled hard to make sure that the one thing that he didn't have fully was a great education and he ensured that I had that. And hey, I'm a great product of Kenneth and Utilin Turton. I grew up to be loved, cherished, and turned into a totally, con I know I tooted my own horn, right? But hey, you all know that. Totally wonderful, loving, and kindness is one of the things that my parents taught me. They always showed that, they gave that, they ensure that everyone that passed by, there was always something that they could give. If it's their last coin, they would. And they're all about family. And finally, an exceptional man. A friend, like I was highlighted, he was that person to everybody. He, you can call on him, you could ask him to do anything. If he could do it, he would. And he was truly, truly, for me, my hero. The first man I have ever loved. First man that has ever loved me. And for that, I am truly grateful. So thank you all. Rest in peace, Daddy. I love you.
Brothers and sisters, we give God thanks for the life of our brother. Um, I never met him, unfortunately, but um, from my little experience meeting with um, Sister Sherian, and well, she, even before this eulogy, taught me a lot um, about him, and I you know, what I hear coming out is certainly a sh strong character of a man, um, whether it is as a father, um, whether it is as a mechanic, a fisherman, um, or a respectful man, a husband, um, certainly he seemed to have that strong character um, of a man whom you respect a lot. And so as you shared, may his soul rest in peace. And um, we certainly want to give God thanks for his life and all the people that he may have touched um, as he had his years here on earth. So my brothers and sisters, as we continue in worship, we now turn to the ministry of the word. And we first will have the epistle reading, followed by the gospel reading, after which we sing the hymn in preparation for the message, Love Lifted Me. Good evening. The epistle reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 58. What am I saying, brothers and sisters, in this is this? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this immortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then this, the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Thanks be to God. Good afternoon. The lesson is taken from Matthew chapter 22, verses, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. 
So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed a strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, Ye of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Word of God. We remain standing as we sing the hymn together, Love Lifted Me.
seated. Also just want to take this opportunity on behalf of the Spice Tongue Methodist Church to offer sincerest condolences to the entire family. Um, I know Sherry Ann said to me, as she said in the eulogy as well, that I get to meet an original 13. <laughs> um, and so I wish I meet more persons um, as I go along, but I offer, want to offer con sincere condolences on behalf of the church um, and pray that during this time, um, you will experience the comfort and peace that only God can give. As we reflect this evening, brothers and sisters, I want us to reflect under the title, Jesus is the Master of the Sea. Jesus is the Master of the Sea of Life. And Matthew 14, verse 25, reads, And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word, which is lamb to our feet, light to our path, as we travel through this world. So God, help us that we may open our hearts and minds and souls to your word. That your word can take root and bear good fruit in our lives. To the glory of your name. Amen. I'm sure that most of us may know better than me, but if you didn't know, you would certainly have heard it through different parts of the service so far, that fishing or being a fisherman was a central part of Brother Kenneth's life. Fishing was one of his first love. And we heard, even as the Men's Fellowship shared their tribute, that fishing and being on the sea often is associated with um, possible danger and those different things. And the truth is, when it comes to the Bible, when Jesus was on earth, fishing and the sea were also a prominent part of the Bible. You remember that of the 12 disciples, there were four who were fishermen before following Jesus. There was Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And even after they started following Jesus, the sea was still a prominent part of their journeys and encounter with Jesus. And so in the passage that we read, it tells us that in Matthew 14, it says, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of, on the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. But, brothers and sisters, one of the things I want to share this afternoon, and just to help us to appreciate, that the writers of the Gospels were not only giving historical accounts of Jesus at the sea, but even more than this, they were communicating deeper messages about who Jesus is as they were on the sea. You see, the sea is a prominent feature in biblical imagery. In other words, it is sometimes used as a literary device. It is often used as a symbol pointing to something much deeper. So I'm sure even if we may not know the Bible fully well, but just if I mention these themes and titles, you will know them. Noah and the flood. I'm sure everybody knows that. Crossing the Red Sea. The river Jordan, as the people were going on to the promised land. Jonah in the belly of the fish. And if you read the Gospels again, Jesus' ministry is centered around the Sea of Galilee. So the question I ask as we reflect this evening is, what kind of place does the Bible portray the sea as? The, the sea is seen as a place of endless possibilities for danger. The sea is seen as a place of endless possibilities for life-threatening circumstances. In fact, to move further away from land out to sea 
is to move into greater uncertainty. So I'm sure we know it. We may not have ever been on the sea, but we watch movies and we watch different shows about people on the sea and we see the wind storms and the lightning storms and the heavy rain and the strong waves and the people go out to sea and their boat engine fail and, you know, when you go out there and if you're in the midst of nowhere and you have nobody around you and your engine fail, then what will become of us? Nobody is near in sight. You could run out of food. You could be robbed. There are dangerous sea animals out there. All kinds of things can go wrong. And you heard Brother McLean sharing that Brother Kenneth said that he faced a lot of dangers out there. In fact, what if I heard correctly, he said that he could have been dead. And so he thanked God that he was alive on several occasions. And so in the passage, the disciples are also experiencing a bit of danger. It says, when evening came, he was there alone, but by the time the boat battered by the waves were far from the land, for the wind was against them. And so we see here the disciples are on a boat and they are facing waves and, 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 and facing great problems out at sea and Jesus is not with them and I'm sure this even resonates recently in Spice Strong if you uh, certain parts before when you drive around and you see the rough seas um, battering re in recent times to the point the first time I was seeing this in Spice Strong where the so rough were the seas that they were coming over into the road but the question is further is, so what does this symbolize for life? What does this symbolize in terms of the significance for life? It tells us that the sea in terms of life is, can be symbol, symbolic of a place of ever-changing scenes. One minute it is calm, another minute it is rough. One minute it's going well, Another minute it is stormy. The sea can be seen as a place in terms of life that is always tempting us to abandon our faith in God. To choose fear and worry over God. So, things like that threaten to provide for our physical needs. Circumstances such as losing our jobs. Losing our possessions to natural disasters where we develop medical circumstances and conditions that we never knew we had. I always remember in my mind vividly of a co-worker that I had who um, was going well, felt that he was good health-wise and going well with his family and until one day he went to get a checkup and realized that he has stage 4 cancer. Or... It could be the death of a loved one or sudden death knocking at our door. Also, the sea can be a place where there can be negative things constantly coming at our lives from, from could be the devil, could be our flesh, could be the world. So the sea is a place where you could have, you may have, so as Sister Sherian shared and, and you know sometimes that's not everybody's reality but thank God Sister Sherian shared about having um, a good home and, and, and being, having a father whom she respected and, and so raised her to be the young woman that she is today. But the sea can be seen as a place where sometimes we grow up and we face some circumstances in our childhood and we face some things that come at us that shape us to be not necessarily as positive as Sister Sherian is now, but it turns out to shape us into be something very negative. Are you with me so far? Sometimes the sea can be a place um, where negative things come at us even from the church. One, one feature of the church right now in our world is church hurt. Where people speak about the fact that they grew up in church and there's this person that they always respected and the person hurt them. Shattered their faith. 
shattered the way, the, how the outlook, they were growing up in church, respecting people and so forth, and then they faced something. So, uh, also, the seek a uh, place where we may even have experienced rejection from parents, from family, from church, all kinds of things. And you know what this results in? If we think about this sea carefully, it's either you get stuck or lost at sea, or it can create some suffering at sea, or it can even cause you to sink and drown at sea. Which means, again, what does this mean for life? In terms of getting lost, circumstances and what the sea brings can cause you to become lost in life. No sense of direction because of the scars and things of life. You're just moving through life. Sometimes it could be where you are facing suffering and holy for discomfort, hardship, inconvenience, hurt as a result of your past. Or it could be that you are sinking where you are just experiencing emotional death, social death, physical death, all kinds of different things. And as a result you decide, boy, I... I don't want anything to do with God, church, faith, or all these different things. But my brothers and sisters, I want to end on a good note. And the good news is, and this is the good news, that Jesus is the master of the sea. Jesus is the master of the sea. The verse that I read in the beginning says, And early in the morning, while the disciples were on the sea, but fighting with the waves and in the boat, this, they didn't know who it was, but it tells us that he came walking towards them on the sea. And this is not the only miraculous thing that Jesus did in the sea. Remember when he called the disciples and they were trying to catch fish and they couldn't catch anything. And he told them, and throw your net over there, and they brought in a whole lot of fish. You would remember that another time they were in a storm, and Jesus was asleep. You could imagine that. Sleeping through a storm on a boat. And he woke up, and he says to the wind and the waves, peace be still. And what Jesus was revealing, what the writers were trying to show us, is that Jesus controls and has power over the sea. That Jesus has control and has power over nature. But further to that, that Jesus has power and control over the circumstances that come our way in life. The good news is, brothers and sisters, that no matter what we face or go through, no matter what comes knocking at our door, that Jesus has shown himself to be the master of the sea. In fact, we see also from Jesus that Jesus can use the dangers of the sea to make us more than conquerors in the same sea. So hear what he said, hear what he does. So they didn't recognize him, they thought it was a ghost. And then Peter comes. Peter said, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come. And Peter decided to trust Jesus. And he steps out of the boat and he starts to walk on water too. Just as Jesus was doing. And brothers and sisters, what that says to us, and in fact, you would think that probably Jesus, when he stepped out of the boat and started walking towards Jesus, that Jesus probably calmed the waves while he was walking. But you get an indication that no, he was walking on the sea even while the waves were raging. It is when he took his eyes off of Jesus and started looking at the strong waves that he began to sink. And what that is saying to us, brothers and sisters, is that no matter what life throws at us, and no matter what the sea may bring at us, Jesus is master of the sea, but not only he's master of the sea, Jesus is able to make us more than conquerors in the midst of our situations. Are you still with me? 
and, and this, this is not new to the New Testament. You see, we see also throughout Scripture that God oftentimes doesn't necessarily take us out of the circumstances of life. But he shows us that he can keep us there and he can make us victorious in the midst of the circumstances. <laughs> so you remember the flood with Noah? The flood wiped out the rest of the world. But the same flood is what God used along with the ark to save Noah and his family. The Red Sea. God part the Red Sea and the people of Israel walked through it. But it is the same Red Sea that when the Egyptians came through, God allowed it to fall through. Joseph, let me use not, no, not just the sea, but in terms of real circumstances, Joseph faced rejection when he was younger from his brothers and others, and he faced all kinds of circumstances. In fact, the circumstances that Joseph faced, Joseph should not have turned out the way he turned out. But my brothers and sisters, Joseph stood to tell the tale to his brothers that he says, what you meant for evil, God meant it for my good. That's why Paul could say in the Bible, brothers and sisters, that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. So Peter walking on water is a demonstration that Jesus and God through Jesus, whether it is that we are facing death knocking at our door, whether it is that we are facing childhood wounds, whether it is that we are facing current circumstances, that Jesus is a able to make us more than conquerors in them. Because you see, brothers and sisters, the disciples wanted to get to us. They were heading to a certain destination. So as they were on the sea, most people who go on the sea don't go on the sea just to live on the sea. They go on the sea to get to a place and to get to another place. A certain destination. But what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, that even though sometimes we want to get to a certain destination, that the sea is a dangerous place. Amen? That even though you may want to get to a certain achievement or a certain place, you never know what is on the sea. You never know what can come your way. You never know what can come into your circumstances. One day everything is okay. Another day things can be turning upside down. But Jesus has given us hope that we don't have to get lost. Amen? We don't have to sink. But we can put our faith in the master of the sea. Because the master of the sea has shown us and proven to us, not just from in the Bible, but I'm sure many people can testify here today that when we trust God and put our faith in God, even in some of the most trying times of life, that God always shows up. Amen, somebody. That God always shows us that he is indeed the master of the sea. That God always shows us that what we thought was so great and so big, that nothing is bigger than God. That what we think would floor us and sink us and, and we couldn't get through it, that Jesus is the master of the sea and he is able to see us through. And guess what? Even when Peter started to sink and sometimes we lose faith, sometimes we lose hope, brothers and sisters, but what Jesus shows us is that even when we lose faith and even when we lose hope, he can save us. Amen, somebody. That he can pull us out of whatever waves we are going through. He can pull us out of whatever storm because Jesus is more than able. So Jesus is not only the master of the sea, but Jesus is also the only lifeguard that could save us from what we see will bring at us. My brothers and sisters, the sea of life 
is a dangerous place. And this is not for any one person. Everybody who walks through life. Life is dangerous. Life has all kinds of uncertainties. All kinds of challenges. All kinds of things that could push us in the wrong direction. But I'm just here to remind us today. That there is hope. And there is only one man I know. Who has mastered the sea. Only one man I know who can serve as captain of our lives. Who can serve as lifeguard even when we start to sink. So that at the end of life, we can find ourselves at one destination. Amen? That at the end of life, we can find ourselves in eternity with God. You see, brothers and sisters, you see, life can toss us and throw us in all kinds of directions and cause us not to reach our destination. But brothers and sisters, I'm saying if you hold on to the master of the sea and if you trust him and put your life in his hands and allow him to be captain and allow him to take you through the circumstances of life, oh, brothers and sisters, he will ensure that you get to your destination. <laughs> Because he says, he says to his disciples, believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. And if it were not so, would I have told you that? He says, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you will be also. That's why the apostle Paul could say, at the end of his life, that I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things in the past, nor things to come. Whatever life wants to throw at me, bring it on. Because nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, everyone. If you want to know what is friendship, you will have to know turn personally. There are very few things that um, he hasn't um, discussed with me as a friend. For that matters to me. It's more than friendship with your brother. When I was down, this guy looked up for me. We went fishing together. For that matter, everyone know Tony as a fisherman and a mechanic. But I know this guy as a scientist. What he couldn't find, he make. This is my personal experience of Thurston. In my mind and in my heart, Kenneth Thurston will never die. For that matter, my belief, nothing that God ever created can die, but I wouldn't go into that. Jordan has returned to the source, which is God. And I hope each one of us in this chapel this evening will experience the friendship that myself and Jordan experience. So much of me, thank you so much.
Brothers and sisters, as we continue, invite us to stand as we reaffirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. It can be found on the page right after King of Love, my shepherd is. I believe in God, the Father, mighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended to the dead. There he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to live. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. At this time, brothers and sisters, we will sing the hymn, Will Your Anchor Hold? And during the singing of this hymn, um, an offering will be taken specifically um, for the Barbados Diabetic Foundation. And naturally, you know, we would understand that this is a request from the Sherian as she does this to assist others um, as the situation with her own loved ones. And so we now sing, and during the singing of this hymn, the offering will be taken. Steadfast 
passen schon weil der Pilos wohl passen to the rock which cannot move und den Pumpern tief in der Seele Amen, let us pray Dear God the giver of all good gifts. We thank you, O oh God, for your continued blessings in our lives. We thank you, O oh God, for the gifts that you continue and blessings in the form of, of monetary ways. So God, we thank you for the opportunity that we can bring this offering before you. And we ask, O oh God, that it is taken specifically for the Barbados Diabetic Foundation. We ask, O oh God, that it will be used to touch lives, that it will be used, O oh God, to help others so that they can know of your love and to overcome some of the challenges in this life. So bless it, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Invite us to be seated as we go to God in prayer. Let us go to God in prayer. Praise be to you, O God, our Father, who created us in your own image for eternal fellowship with you. Praise and thanksgiving to you, O Christ, our Lord and our God, who have overcome the sharpness of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers and are now seated at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. Praise and blessing be to you, O Holy Spirit, God, our Comforter, who bear witness within us of our acceptance with the Father and have become the pledge of our eternal inheritance. All praise and glory, blessing and honor, thanksgiving and worship be to you, O blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Continue in prayer. We bless your name, O God, for the life of our brother, whom we today lay to rest. We give you thanks for the joy and blessing his life has brought to others, for his service to his generation, according to your will and for every happy remembrance of his life. We bless you for your mercy and goodness, which have followed him all the days of his life, that now the trials of this world are over, and death itself is past. Receive him into your perfect kingdom and bring us with all who have lived and served you faithfully to the fullness of your eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Eternal God, who have made us all and hate nothing that you have made and have given your Son for our redemption, we commend our brother, Kenneth Turton, to your perfect mercy and wisdom, eternal rest grant unto him, and let perpetual light shine upon him. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, as we seek to sing our last hymn in this time of worship, we will sing, And Can It Be? And just to mention that um, as we finish the worship service, um, I would just process, um, recess, sorry, and because there will be no burial, as some of us may know, um, the family will have a private um, time and ceremony that they will do, but we will, what we would normally do um, at the graveside, I will do at the very end um, as I recess. All right, so I'm just sharing that information. So let's sing to the glory of God, and can it be. Yeah. 